to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. If you've never listened to my podcast before, then welcome to you. And please hit that subscribe button. It's hugely beneficial to us podcasters. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing other people who did or planned to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description, of course, as well as the links to the guest. As of always, a portion of the proceeds from this podcast do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. I have such an incredible guest with me today. His name is Stefan. Uh, he is also a podcast host himself. He's an overcomer and a bit of an overachiever in some ways. He is absolutely amazing. I was very lucky and very blessed to be on his podcast not too long ago. And Stefan Neff, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. It is a privilege and an honor to be here. So for those of the, the audience members that are already picking up on it, you have a gorgeous accent. <laughs> and I know you live in New Zealand, which is clearly you do not have a Kiwi accent. So where is your accent originally from? Uh, I'm a cosmopolitan, but I was originally born in Germany, Heidelberg, uh, Mannheim, the, the south center of Germany. But I lived around the world and I was I was blessed because I got to know so many other different cultures. So my accent is probably very bastardized and <laughs> depends upon how tired I am. Sometimes people think I'm Irish and sometimes people think God knows where from. Uh, so so it's, it's sometimes a good <laughs> guessing game. <laughs> I tell people all the time, my accent's so confused, even it doesn't know where it's from. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Man. So we originally connected through Podmatch. I love them. Um, mm -hmm. And you were already aware of what it is that I tend to talk about on my show. So we're just going to cut straight to the chase here. What was the trauma that you had to overcome to be able to get you on the trajectory that you're on now? <laughs> <laughs> so where to choose from where to choose from <laughs> it's like a grab bag right <laughs> i know i know let's see what comes out today uh no the, the reality is we are all i mean trauma is like it comes in layers and it often starts in in early childhood with trauma that we have nicely compartmentalized and pushed somewhere away not to be remembered um and i mean i, I don't i didn't have a, a horrible childhood but there was certainly some bullying there at school there was certainly uh my mum was a single mum who was working hard to bring the money in so I was a latchkey child um probably not the greatest of male role models uh so you know you could say that there was quite a bit of trauma building up there without me even recognizing it but I think one of the, the key moments really the defining moments in my life was when I was in the wrong place and wrong time and I was the victim of a gang assault and Oof. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I had other words. Um, no, at that time, I was—I don't think I was swearing so much. Uh, at that <laughs> time, I think I was—I was just completely flabbergasted. Completely, why are you doing that? That was literally what I asked the gang leader whilst he was beating me up. And uh, it is—it was weird. So my world completely changed forever uh, in that night. I was about 13, first girlfriend, was just sitting romantically on, on a, waiting for my tram to come. And, um, yeah, the wow. gang moved on after a little while. Um, I had narrowly escaped a knife. I had, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was very scary. And there I was alone. And I, my train arrived. So I, I stepped onto the train. I had to go past the, the driver who looked at me and looked away and I was sitting down somewhere and there were some people in there. No one gave a damn. And I think that was the second subconscious lesson that I learned that there is no one out there to help me. 
uh, if I have to make a change, I have to make it. And that was when I descended into quite a dark world of, with hindsight, PTS, um, at that time, survival. And so my my bruises hadn't healed yet when I went uh, when I started training in martial arts. Um, at that time in Germany, you could train with the law enforcement agencies. They had sort of police sport clubs uh, where you could uh, train jujutsu, the, the, the German version of self defense. Um, and yeah, the next four years I became Rambo, uh, both in at, in mind as well as in body. I had a gorgeous physique. I mean, there are some advantages there. Let's be quite clear about that. Um, uh, but, of course, my mind was dark. I was constantly ready. I was constantly ready to uh, defend myself because I had brought the gang leader behind bars and for three years. And he threatened me. He would kill me the moment he gets out. So I knew I had three years in my mind, in my simplified, catastrophizing mind, uh, after which I have a life and death showdown. And yeah, it was weird times. Um, I became quite good in the martial arts. Uh, I focused on the more effective side of things rather than the dance side of things. Um, yeah, that was that. But then time moved on and I actually ended up in uh, the university and several things happened at the same time. Firstly, I knew that this guy would never, ever find me. And I had moved away from town. So it was the time before the internet. Uh, I knew now nah, there's no chance that he gets me. Secondly, I discovered girls. Um, <laughs> thirdly, I discovered alcohol. And mm. this combination was actually a blessing at that time because my life was so dark and I was so, so... Um, constantly fighting, hypervigilant with hindsight, all good attributes for a doctor. So you, you actually can't catch me out easily in my profession. So I became a good doctor because of many of the traits of PTS. So I... I, it comes, it's, it's a blessing in disguise to some regard, but it, with some regard, and, and in other terms, of course, it eats you up from the inside. But oh, I, had, absolutely. I had a beautiful, beautiful construct around it. I was the survivor. I was Rambo. I was Mel Gibson and <laughs> Lethal Weapon. I was Bruce Willis. Okay. I was, you know, these were my heroes. That was how I modeled myself. So it is normal for you to get up in the morning, naked, walk down, have a sip of beer, have a drag of your cigarette whilst you're having a piss. Lethal weapon, and that part one, the opening <laughs> scene with Mel Gibson. Okay, that's normal. Okay, that was me. <laughs> well, and um, people idolize these roles in the films too, and they don't realize how unhealthy this is. But they show this in the movies, and it looks so sexy that women are drawn to this too, which can create <laughs> terrible relationships with people. <laughs> too shit. Too shit. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I had I had uh, many relationships, <laughs> and I'm I'm never sure. I don't think anyone at that time really. Um, thought I would be a good project that they can heal me. I don't think that that was the case. Um, no, it is far more an issue of, uh, yeah, good body, uh, talking the game, uh, not much behind it, but who cares? Um, I was the pirate uh, when other girls were surrounded by insurance salesmen. Let's put it like that. And wow. it, yeah, no, it was, I was successful in many, in many regards there. Uh, but you can't live that life. You can't keep going in that life. Basically, uh, living in a dark world and idolizing the wrong men. Oh, yeah. The Mel Gibsons. Yeah. That's all, right. the, all the men that I was attracted to as a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and me. Well, it had to get much worse before it got much better. I had run away from the pain and from the darkness with the help of alcohol and women and work. Well, that's mm -hmm. it, probably. These were the three isms that I was, um, that, that were riding me. Um, and it, it worked for a while. 
Uh, but of course, you can't keep living like that. And I think that was the hardest bit for me. There's this kind of, um, the alcohol worked very well until it didn't. And I had not developed any positive coping mechanisms. I did not have the the tools that I have got nowadays. So I didn't have an alternative. So when life decided to give me more trauma and more trauma, and then add some more, just for good measure, <laughs> I just kept going with working harder. Um, by that time, later down the line, I was married. But my wife was equally drinking uh, heavily. She had her own trauma. And so here we were probably in a nice codependence uh, going yeah. for many years. And it was basically work, drink, be knackered and pass out. Uh, that was pretty much my life for quite some years. And I worked really hard. And, and so in the sense of uh, both in my daily work, but I also did quite a few r bit of research here and there. And, and we emigrated uh, to various new places around the world. So it was, I was busy. I was just so busy. Uh, but again, I never learned positive coping mechanisms. And that sooner or later caught up with me. I was getting worse and worse and worse uh, in the sense of uh, depression, anxiety, were becoming overriding uh, uh, movements, tidal waves, really, tsunamis, shall I say, that were occupying me. And wow. this was, it was hard. It was, it was hard. And there were many a times when I was just bawling my eyes out it was not at all um uh, barely understandable due to the, the the heavy medication of vodka um but it was just so much trauma so much new stuff that that was happening and i didn't know i didn't i didn't have a way out and there were no real ways out and i, I see that nowadays um nowadays i'm nine years uh without alcohol and the same shit happens. Uh, hard things happen. And you understand that there is no easy way out. But it's uh, nowadays I live far more in the moment. I feel my feelings. I have gotten to know my emotions rather than running away from them. I can nowadays accept an anxiety attack. I can accept a period of low mood. And I say, okay, these are messengers, messengers who want to tell me something. Um, am I hungry, angry, lonely, tired? The simplified version. Are my, my survival needs guaranteed? And often enough, they are not. And especially the last three years, no one I have ever met in the last three years had an easy time. Let it be due to social isolation or problems related to COVID or due to the economic downturn, the changing world situation, the worrying issues about climate uh, change that for some of us are becoming very, very real. Um, so it is, uh, there are lots of things happening that don't make things easy. And uh, right now, I mean, I mean, the, the last two months, three months were horrible for me. But I have learned different ways of dealing with it. I've learned that the power of breathing can be there and then changing my state, my physical state, and in turn changing my mind the way it works. I've learned to listen to the catastrophizing me in my head and take action against it to actually say, yeah, okay, that could possibly happen. And yes, that could be, but the chances are no. Um, so why don't we actually open that email and just see what it says, even if it is from a very toxic person and a person who is a real ass. Um, <laughs> okay, let's open this email. And yes, as predicted, there are not nice things in there, but stick with the facts. Don't let emotions ride you see what this person is saying, probably see the distress that this person himself or herself is in, um, and just stick with the facts and move on. Boom, done, dealt with. And suddenly, 
this email has been ticked off and it's no longer ravaging me from the inside. Um, I have paid far more attention to my physical well-being in the sense of doing regular exercise. Um, I've taken on a, a strength coach to actually kick my ass and hold me accountable. <laughs> and it is beautiful. By just doing that, I have got, I have changed. Whilst in my drunken dreams, um, I would sing like Meatloaf. I would fight like <laughs> John Wick um, and, you know, dance like a god. Um, I have to say now I'm actually getting back to that and actually training those things again. Those things that in the past gave me joy, those things that in the past I looked up to. Uh, once upon a time, I was a good dancer. I was a good martial artist. And I was a good fighter. Uh, I was, I was, uh, and I, I sang, well, probably I sang crap. Um, but I have decided, well, actually, hang on, you love singing. Why not sing a bit more, even if it sounds shit? <laughs> and, you know, last night I was I was doing some work. I was going for some some uh, just office work, and I put some meatloaf on, and I sang with meatloaf. And suddenly I realized, hey, hey, you have improved compared with a month, two, three months ago. Your voice has uh, your voice has become stronger. You know, I live far more in the moment, and I strongly nowadays subscribe to the uh, the five minute gardener. In other words, I try so hard. To do every every day, I do try to do five minutes of those things that are really important for me, not more, not less. So the five minute gardener refers to the fact if you were every day to go into your garden for only five minutes, but five minutes regular, after a week you would see quite some change in your garden. After a month, your family would think, wow, our garden looks good. And after three months, you've got the neighbors standing over the fence and looking <laughs> in and thinking, wow. And that is just five minutes. I imagine doing that with a relationship, doing that with your work, doing that with wealth, doing that with all those kind of things that are important to you. And that is what I do nowadays. So my change from being very hyper-reactive to outside stresses and inside stresses in my head has changed towards a far more habit-driven, intentional life where every moment I see as a privilege of choice. Every moment I've got a choice to do either something that helps my mental wealth or destroys it. And that applies in the first instance to nutrition. So I've started to become a, a functional medicine specialist this year. So I'm learning shitloads of, of information about our gut microbiome, about the way that nutrition is medicine, um, how the importance of sleep, the importance of exercise, all those things. So I've actually uh, actively started to explore the scientific uh, data behind all those platitudes, how you need to get more sleep. Well, nowadays I can tell you exactly why. And it's beautiful. And now I actually make a point. I go to bed early. I try to get my nine hours sleep. Um, well, there are days where it doesn't work out. Cool. Well, so <laughs> such is life. Um, but more often than not, I eat very healthy. I sleep enough. I do exercise. And suddenly you feel different. Okay. That doesn't mean to say the world is, is magically getting better. And don't, don't get me wrong. Shit still happens. As I said, last two months were not pretty. But I'm so much more resilient. I'm so much more in control of my boat. I'm, yeah, it is, it's beautiful. I'm, I, I, it, my life is still a circus, but I'm no longer the bearded lady. I'm the <laughs> ringmaster. Okay, so and that is that is really nice. So I like that. I like that new life of me. Um, I that is what I'm proud of, and that is, I guess, if there's one legacy, then this is the legacy that I want to live. This this kind of living amends, this kind of living a life where integrity, authenticity, and and responsibility to yourself, authenticity, where that all makes sense, where that all is truly 
part and parcel of your life and not just some some hearsay. I want to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. That's fantastic. I know that you are an actual doctor. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people might assume with your journey that you would be a therapist, but that's not the case. Mm. What is it uh, that you do in medicine? <laughs> I'm an anesthetist, so <laughs> anesthesiologist in, for the Americans. Um, it is basically um, um, the dude who you call when shit hits the fan. Um, so in my nice boring life um i'm the guy who uh is by your side when you go through a hard time and have to have surgery i'm the guy who makes sure that you're the safest possible version of yourself and i'm your wingman so to speak through an adventure um but the other part of being an anesthetist is that whenever some serious shit hits the fan they call the anesthetist uh, let that be in the in, in labor and you're screaming for the epidural or <laughs> let that be in a severe trauma um, where the anesthetist is very, very welcome anytime. Uh, let it be a very sick child. You know, it is virtually whenever something really nasty happens, the anesthetist gets involved. So we're a little bit like the, the special forces of the of the medical world. Uh, we come in, you know, rescue the damsel in our shining armor, and then we <laughs> we get out of there. Um, so that's that's that that's nice, and that fits with my with my my uh, the kind of of uh, PTS <laughs> very nicely. Right. It fits with your personality. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm the guy who runs towards it. the fire uh, right. and not away from it. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> with all its advantages and disadvantages, okay? Right. Um, maybe there is a hero complex uh, somewhere in there, and I'm not not disguising that. Um, the white knight syndrome. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. at the same token, I I nowadays accept it, and with my history of PTS, I just say yes, of course. Uh, how could it be otherwise? And I just then put these uh, different roles, put them back into the cupboard or into the dungeon in some cases. Um, I've got one dude who lives in me who is an amazing guy. Um, I mean, he is he is the true survivor. Um, he's still from now and then comes out. And sometimes he can be so helpful because he's the guy who has got no emotions. He's the guy who is... Oh, I met him again start of this year and... He just came out, and when I opened my eyes, I was I saw everything in this ice cold, clear, clear way. It was like like standing outside in a in an ice frozen uh, tundra, and it is everything is clear, and it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. I could make decisions that were not good uh, or not nice. Let's call it like that. Um, and it was wonderful. But this guy is also, if, if, he, if I let him out to play too long, he becomes self-destructive. Um, he only lives for the moment. He makes hard decisions right now. But he would also have no hesitation of saying, hey, come on, let's have a drink. Mm. Um, because we know in the past, you know, that has helped us so much. Um, so it, again, you, it's good to have different personalities, but you need to get to know them and need to know their strengths and weaknesses and use them in the, in the right way. So yes. life for me is, is a big chess game um, where I from now and then play the rook, from now and then the queen. Um, I never get to dress up like the queen, but maybe I should. <laughs> That's a different story. That comes in a different... <laughs> no, kidding, kidding, kidding. <laughs> I just, um, so yeah, we just need to, to make choices. And it is a privilege for us to make these choices. Yeah. It's a privilege for us to feel and get to know ourselves this way. And start loving yourself. Start accepting yourself for who you are right now, warts and all, because this is your baseline. Right now is my baseline. I'm at 56. Um, yes, all that stuff has happened to me in the past, but today is a new baseline. Today, right now, I have made a commitment that I get up early in the morning. Uh, you know, have a nice coffee whilst I'm chatting with you here, and that is the start of my day. So, how? What is then next? Um, I've got some plans for today where I um, just will grow further, and that is fantastic. That is what we can do. Each and every one of us. 
I absolutely love that. And I know you share all of your passion with this through your podcast. You've got a YouTube channel. You're on social media. It's everything is under the name of My Steps of Sobriety, which is the same Correct. name as your book. Correct. Correct. Now, which soon comes out. By the time you guys are hearing that, the third edition is well and truly out there. So go out there and check it out. My Steps to Sobriety is basically uh, a bit about my journey with regards to overcoming alcohol, but more more a a stepwise approach for you guys to maybe reconsider your life with alcohol if you're still drinking, or giving you a lot of action plans and, and help um, if you're in your early phases of sobriety, early stages. And it's beautiful. And it is uh, it is a, a lovely baseline um, from which to work on and very soon you you are further down the path and you might then choose to to think okay who do i want to be when i grow up because it's not about the let's stop drinking it's about the trauma that has led us to try to escape our reality how to deal with that and then how to move forward who you want to be when you grow up that's really the key question that you need to ask yourself and again, every single living moment, you have the privilege to think along these lines and make decisions. And there is compound interest. Guys, do trust me there. If you start eating healthy, looking after your sleep, looking after your joy, looking after all those things that are really fundamentally your needs, very soon, passion and joy and fulfillment will come out of you just as, as as sure as in the spring you will see some flowers coming out of the ground that is a given if you nurture the soil so to speak by doing the right things so don't accept the oh poor me poor me why me no that was the past, guys, okay? That victim uh, role. No, I want you to move at least into the survivor, realizing that if you, as a survivor, take care of yourself in all the, the right aspects, very soon you become a thriver. So victim, survivor, thriver. And that is the journey that I encourage you to come on. That's where Amanda and me are already a bit further down the line. But ultimately... You guys are just a little bit behind us. So we, we very much invite you to come along. As if you if you want to know more about me, go to my website, mystepstosobriety.com, where you see all the books that I've written, uh, links to the show. If you have got an, an, an amazing story yourself, that is where you can find ways how to be a guest on my show. Um, but it is really, it is let's go out there and let's let's shout it from the rooftops that it's okay not to be okay but it's not okay to keep quiet about it and be eaten up by shame guilt and all the negative emotions that really don't suit you and don't don't help you to grow yes you can you have done things that you are probably not so proud of uh, i have done many of them um, <laughs> but um, that was the past the past does not equal the future. Yeah. Stefan, do you have a copy of your book? Have you got maybe a paragraph or two that you would like to share with the audience? If you don't, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I do, I do. Awesome. And the simple thing, uh, the, the simple thing what we can do is um, let's actually compare the 12 steps. Um, mm -hmm. So one of, one of the, the things that I wanted to do is to, in this book is to, demystify the 12 steps because everyone thinks oh my god 12 steps my god we're going to a church and they're going to ram down <laughs> the religion down my throat um and my god they're talking about god uh, and they're praying um the reality uh, is actually very very different i want you guys to imagine that you have got a restaurant you're the owner of a restaurant, and the restaurant every night is full to the to, to brimming. It's it's wonderful. You're really successful. Your best friend has equally got a restaurant, 
I mean, you look into his restaurant, you see little tumbleweeds rolling around <laughs> as maybe the odd guy who has lost his way <laughs> finds his way in there. And your best friend one day gives you a ring and says, hey, look, uh, please, please, can we have a chat? We both have restaurants. I'm at my restaurant. I'm, I'm just close to bankruptcy. What would you do as a friend? You would probably go around and I mean you would probably uh, sit down in the front of the house and would order a few dishes and whilst you're sitting there you would look around look at the decor look at the behavior of the staff um, look at the menu then you would taste the food and then you would probably go behind the scenes and with your friend and look at you know how does the, the workflow go in the kitchen um, what kind of menu items do sell well, which ones don't sell well. Um, and you do a really good inventory and, and see what is actually going on behind the scenes. Then you think of it and then you, you sit down and, and make some changes. You sort of think through and you, you talk to your, to your friend, hey, look, what do you think? And you make a plan of change. Thereafter, you actually put those things into place. So maybe you throw away, uh, throw out some items on the menu that no one was ordering and therefore your stock levels uh, are much better and you don't need to waste as much uh, you maybe give the front of the house a new decor you may, maybe you throw throw uh, you fire a person who is actually uh, not good for your business and that's cool so you make the changes and then you probably want to go to your regular customers and you want to say, hey, guys, uh, things have been rough for us. And, but, hey, we are same management, but new vibe. Why don't you come back and check us out? And as a, a welcome back gift, we the drinks, two drinks are in the house or 30% off your mains. Um, buy one, get one free, something like that. And then down the line, probably uh, if everything picks up and your friend will probably put a quality assurance program in. Make sure that he regularly reviews the workflows, reviews the menu, reviews feedback from the customers, etc. And down the line, probably you both of these restaurants are going nuts. Both of you are very, very happy. And your friend, through this journey, has learned so much that he says, wow. I want to give back to the community to I want to do the same that you have done to me. So he might do a brunch morning for failing restaurateurs. Um, so he has got a, a meeting once a month for once a fortnight um, where people can meet, greet, uh, steam off, ask for help, etc. That story would be very logical to absolutely everyone out there. In reality, what I've described to you there is a 12-step program. The first three steps is that you admit that you need deep in trouble, um, that you can't do it alone, but you expect that there is help out there. So in this case, the friend got in touch with me. The next uh, three steps are really that you take a brutal inventory of what is going on. In this case, the restaurant. But if this was a 12-step uh, program, you would do exactly the same with regards to your inner self. Um, you would write lists, resentment lists, and blame lists, and all kind of lists, um, and then work through them with someone. Down the line, you will implement changes, and you create new habits. You uh, actually do a kind of a, of a regular feedback checking in, uh, journaling, those kind of things to actually see are you remaining on the right track every single day. You do uh, make amends. And then down the line, you your quality assurance program, you keep going with all the regular good good stuff. But because you, you're you going down this path, you say, well, let's make sense of it. And let's actually start giving back to the community. And suddenly you become a sponsor in a 12-step program. Or suddenly you uh, start with a podcast uh, or write a book <laughs> or things like that. And that is a 12-step program. So, yes, it is often held in church halls because they are often for free or nominal price. Um, and that's about the only reason that that is there. Many, many of the programs have nothing to do with God. The only thing that from now on in where God comes in is simply the 12-step program was written in the 30s. And 
as part of the sales kind of tactic uh, that the, the founders at that time thought would be good. They brought uh, the, the God and the Christianity into that um, that that stepwise program. Um, but actually, the, the founder of uh, of AA was actually not religious. He didn't believe in God. <laughs> um, so wow. here you go. But, but they were good salesmen. Um, so therefore, they said, now, nah, 1930s in America, well, God needs to be in there. Um, so nowadays, there are many programs are secular. Uh, many programs are uh, branching out into a more science approach uh, or science-based approach. So that's really, really important to know. So uh, that is one of my chapters where I demystify the 12-step program uh, and just put uh, clarity there, what it really is. It's, it's help for a failing business. And in this case, the failing business is you. And that's beautiful. So therefore, I'm very vested. I have a very vested interest in that, in that business nowadays. And it is, it's good. I mean, every day, without even recognizing it, I do inventories. I do cross-check if what I'm feeling is actually true or if it is a heap of bullshit that <laughs> my brain tells me uh, when in reality, when, when reality is actually different. Is. So we have all... We have all got the privilege of choice. And I invite you all to go out there and move away from the victim role and become a survivor. And you're already doing that. You know why I know that? Because you're listening to this podcast. That's right. So you're taking already (laughs) action. How cool is that? So now I want you guys to take more action because I want you to go to the like and subscribe um, button down there. Leave a comment for Amanda. Um, Support her in what she is doing because she is, this is a labor of love. This is her spending time that she could otherwise spend quite happily um, by doing other things for her own recovery. Um, for her own mental health. Although, as a little secret, w- both Amanda and I, we are, we are lovingly addicted to, uh, to our shows and we are, we are learning so much by talking to our guests. So this is actually a blessing in disguise for us. So Amanda, just by me verbalizing, for you giving me the platform to, to talk today, <laughs> um, I... I had to reflect on quite a few things. And at times your mouth opens and things come out and you think, huh, I haven't actually looked at it from that angle. <laughs> and that is quite cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite things of doing this is you always learn something about yourself every day. Mm. Yeah. So true. <laughs> we only have a couple minutes left for the episode and I still have to ask my absolute most favorite question Ooh. ever. What is one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? My willingness to survive. My my grit that I do not give up. There were too many times when I could have easily given up. And being an educated man, I... No, my my mind immediately gave me many ways of uh, permanently dealing with a temporary distress. Um, unfortunately, that is what my brain does well. But equally, there is somewhere in there something that stops me, something that tells me, just hang on a little bit longer. You can do it. We know we we can do it. So this this thing in me, this power in me, um, is is there, and is working with me and is by my side, and that is beautiful. I'm grateful to this presence, to this being in me, that can give me hope at times when it would be so easy to give up hope. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you'll find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this.
my boss is a bit tight-fisted. I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash growth from darkness.